Roger Robinson is a dear friend and a longtime colleague. We worked together, uh, though we didn't interact much in the uh, Reagan years, but uh, subsequently have spent a lot of time uh, making common cause. But um, his contribution, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, to President Reagan's efforts to actually institute a different policy from detente one that actually served to roll back and ultimately defeat the Soviet Union, owes a great deal of credit for its success to the work that Roger did as the International Economic Affairs Director for the National Security Council under President Reagan. He uh, served before all of that as a senior vice president at uh, Chase Manhattan Bank with responsibility for the lending the bank did in of all places, the Soviet bloc, uh, which taught him a lot about where the bodies were buried and enabled him to exhume them and uh, do uh, uh, some very important strategic retooling on the US side, which uh, ultimately resulted, as I said, in the end of the USSR itself. Uh, he's been looking for a second act ever since and uh, has actually done some very important work on terrorism and is now focused uh, very directly on the subject that we're here to discuss, uh, China. And specifically, as he did with the Soviet Union, figuring out what they're doing with the money to prop up themselves and operate against us. Uh, in this case, the money is ours. So Roger, come and talk to us about uh, what's up with the markets and supporting the Chinese Communist Party. Well, again, apologize uh, to Chet <clears throat> for taking his slot, uh, but uh, I'm delighted to be here. I've had the chance to participate in a number of committee sessions uh, on a subject that is uh, <clears throat> going to be new to many of you who haven't uh, been following the work of this committee, perhaps uh, to date. But uh, we've certainly tried to use this forum as, a, uh, as an instrument of bringing to, to light a really truly shocking new front in the struggle with Beijing and that is their access to and use of resources pulled from our capital markets and for those that aren't sort of Wall Street aficionados we're talking about the stock and bond markets of the United States which are roughly speaking the size of the rest of the world's combined I mean, once upon a time in the early 80s when I was struggling with the Soviet threat, along with the president and uh, a number of uh, his inner circle, uh, notably Bill Clark, his national security advisor, at that time we had a monopoly. And it was a key monopoly uh, having to do with natural gas deliveries to Western Europe. We controlled uh, the only oil and gas equipment and technology that could drill through permafrost, that uh, because of our North Slope experience in Alaska, and leave it to say, we use that leverage very effectively to stop the Soviets from utterly dominating Western Europe's natural gas markets and doubling their hard currency income in the process. They'd still be muddling through. You wouldn't have to worry about Putin. You'd be worrying about the Soviet Union today. So this was not a given that this was going to all work out, I can tell you right now. And we did have to break them into matchsticks vis-a-vis -vis their hard currency cash flow and their access to Western government and commercial bank credits, which were underwriting 100% of the hard currency cost of the external Soviet empire. That's a disturbing fact. And we're in a kind of twisted, similar circumstance today with a much more diverse economy, a much, a much larger economic juggernaut, a much greater threat in many respects in the People's Republic of China. However, uh, although we've lost our monopoly on oil and gas equipment and technology of the type that we enjoyed in the early 80s, we do have a new monopoly, kind of, in the 21st century, and that is we have all the money. We have the investable capital. About 40 plus percent, depending on estimates, uh, are residing here. The Japanese, who are in lockstep with us on what I'm going to be talking to you about and have known about this for years, 
and I've worked with them very closely at the highest levels, uh, they control 20% of the world's investable capital. So the two of us are 60% of the action, would be my rough guess. Now, do we need the Japanese? No. W it would it be a nice touch to have them? Very much so. And we hope that they'll stay in train with us. Uh, as far as Europe's concerned, as usual, we have a very different philosophy. As, uh, as you just heard from our previous speaker, uh, they're obviously in the go-along-to-get-along mode with Beijing, much as they were with the Soviet Union. It's kind of an Asian ospolitik all over again. We just seem, can't seem to get it right when we talk about uh, common values and principles on national security. However, let's hope. But I'm certainly not going to rely on our European friends in this particular context. I'm here in the capacity, as I might mention, as, my, as a chairman of a of the Prague Security Studies Institute, a think tank that I established nearly 20 years ago in Prague in the Czech Republic so that I can be a little more freewheeling in my comments. I do have a day job called uh, RWR Advisory Group, and in that capacity we've developed a, over the past, well, seven, some seven years ago, a software tool called IntelTrack that tracks and visually maps every external transaction of China and Russia worldwide, every day. And we have seven years of data to date, and all different ways to search it and display it. So that gives us a very granular feel for what they're doing, not what they're saying, which is absolutely key, as you know, particularly uh, as everybody's uh, gilding the lily on the true story here. So that said, we have a big problem that lots of you have never heard of, that you're not going to see on television, that you're not going to see in a testimony. You're not going to even hear about it at a cocktail party. You're not going to see one administration meeting on it. You're not going to see one congressional caucus on it. You're not going to see anything at the state and local level on it in America. And yet it implicates 40 to $60 trillion dollars of funds under management. And it is the national security dimensions of China's expanding, rapidly expanding presence in the U.S. capital markets. We hear lots about trade, we hear lots about tariffs, in part because the Chinese are comfortable with that subject. They can play that game all day long, as we're finding out. Sure, it might be painful, highly manageable, right? I wonder why the money never comes up. Isn't that interesting? Because that's where they live and die. That's why it doesn't come up. And Wall Street, you can be sure, never wants this to see the light of day, the conversation we're having now. Because there's this little natty problem that in the history of the United States, we've never screened, vetted, performed due diligence, whatever term of art you'd like to use, on who are the Chinese coming to our markets? Who are their network of subsidiaries? What are their track records in national security and human rights abuses? Have we ever looked? No. Do we have any mechanism to look? No. Is the SEC in charge of this and supposed to be looking? Yes. Why? Because these are material asymmetric risk to share value and corporate reputation. I mean, let's put aside our type of feelings of patriotism and national security and doing the right thing. You're not going to get very far with those sentiments in Wall Street, sadly. But if you talk about material risk, when you talk about disclosure, transparency, corporate governance, risk management, rule of law, reliable statistics, you can get the market's attention there because that's their lingo. And if we don't use their lingo, we're going to be talking about this and whistling past the graveyard five or ten years from now when we're so deep in Chinese securities, probably 36 months from now, that you wake up one morning like a, the, another 150 million Americans and you find that 12, 14, 17, 22 percent of your retirement account and your investment portfolios are in Chinese securities. Well, guess what? You've got most of the American people that's going to be lobbying for there to be no sanctions or penalties against China 
because of the damage it could do to their investment portfolios. Do we really think that Beijing is not alert to this? Do we really think that this isn't the secret plan? Do we really think that while we're looking at the shiny object of trade that they're comfortable us concentrating on, that we're missing trillions of dollars moving into our markets insidiously from bad actors? Who do I mean by bad actors? I mean advanced weapons manufacturers for the PLA. I mean human rights abusers that are selling the surveillance cameras and the facial recognition technology to incarcerate over a million Uyghurs in Xinjiang in concentration camps, who are picking up Tibetans at train stations you know, to make sure that they're cowed and incarcerated for that matter. In other words, major human rights aiders and abettors of abuse. We've got sanctions violators. We've got known hackers. We've got uh, South China Sea island builders and those militarizing those islands. We have nuclear and missile underwriters for North Korea. We have proliferators of weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles. Is this who we had in mind financing with our hard-earned retirement dollars? Is this what we have in mind faceless fund managers doing with our money? This is not some abstraction. This isn't uh, my view of missile defense versus yours. I mean, a more intellectual conversation. This involves your money. And how many of us know what's in our portfolios? I sure don't. Again, you know, when you're looking at your pension system, you're looking at thousands of companies in little small print, right? And you don't know what's actively managed, what stocks they're buying individually, what they're holding passively through index funds and exchange-traded funds, mutual funds. Nobody has the time to plow through that to see what their exposure is to the People's Republic of China, and particularly the bad actors that reside there. We rely on professional fund managers to do that. There's only one small problem. They don't give a damn about the national security and human rights uh, considerations of the United States. They're not tuned in to our principles and values and moral compass. I don't mean all, of course. But this, they're about return on investment. And they're about how they interpret their fiduciary responsibility. So that is a big problem, and we need to make them care. I mean, you need to be asking them what your exposure is to China. Guess what? They won't be able to answer you. You want to know what their subsidiaries of those parent companies, who are they? They can't answer that. They have no clue. In fact, they'll stonewall you till the end of time if you're not doggedly persistent. What about your state legislators? What about your local media? What about all the folks that you could mobilize, your congress, your congressmen and, and senators, state senators? In other words, there is a lot that we could all be doing if we were activists on this, to expose this into the light of day. You know, how much do the Chinese have in our markets? Are we talking about a few billion here and there? No, no, no. Hundreds of billions, maybe as much as a trillion, are there now. They want two or three trillion more in the next 36 months. <clears throat> MSCI, Emerging Market Index, $2 trillion subscribed to that index, $14 trillion more mimic that index, meaning <clears throat> buy reflexively whatever MSCI buys. $16 trillion, right? Well, MSCI has increased its weighting given China fourfold and are buying hundreds of Chinese companies right out of the mainland, A shares, as they're called, and putting them into the MSCI index, where all of that 16 trillion in funds under management has to buy that stock. It's not like I want this stock and I don't want that stock. That's not your option. No, no, no. You buy the whole package. So who's in the MSCI index? I'll tell you, Hike Vision, the concentration camp boys, 
on surveillance cameras, DAWA Technologies, same category on human rights, AVIC, PLA, Advanced Fighter Aircraft, multiple sanctions of the United States, UAVs, all kinds of equipment, China Shipbuilding, oh, who are they? Only ballistic missile submarines, including boomers, with ICBMs targeting our cities. Gee, is that what you had in mind with your retirement dollars? Let's underwrite them, why don't we? Let's underwrite uh, <clears throat> China commun uh, Communications and Construction Company that built the South China Sea Islands. In other words, the list goes on. I'm giving you a small sampling. Now, we did two years of research on this. We only started to surface these findings in May of this year, in, in, sorry, in March of this year. So that's why we're only gathering momentum now. And I'm grateful to the committee for having provided the platform to do this kind of thing. And I'll just say one quick word about the Russians. I don't want to ignore them completely. They have 25 companies in our markets by our last count. 24 of them in the over-the-counter market because it's where the Chinese love to be too because it's less regulated and no transparency and so forth. You know, what a, what a free lunch that is. Seven of the 25 Russian companies are sanctioned by the United States. You can't do business with them with a 100-foot pole. But you can sure invest in them, and you can sure fund them with your money. Has anybody ever looked? Does anybody care? No. Is this have a kind of a deliberate feel to you a little bit? Or is this just, uh, we missed it? You're missing 40 to 60 trillion? I don't think so. <laughs> so here's where we really are, ladies and gentlemen. So I want us to preserve the rest of the time, if there is any. For questions, but I appeal to you to see if you're to test the system and to go to your fund managers and just just play this out and see what happens and see if I'm right about the stone wall and then go to your state legislator and then go to your local media and say what's up with this I can't get answers maybe the LA Times can with CalPERS uh, that's a story by the way by itself that doesn't quit, that the Epoch Times just did a huge expose on. And I'll tell you, if you want to see something troubling, you might turn to that sometime soon by Nan Su. Tell us. Well, the, 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 the deputy, the former deputy chief in, in, uh, in investment officer of <coughs> China's State Administration of Foreign Exchange, SAFE. It really controls their foreign exchange reserves. Three trillion dollars of funds under management right there. A gentleman by the name of Ben Ming. He was honored by being in China's Thousand Talents Plan. Well, that's a kind of a recruiting, ultimately prestigious headhunting operation that helps bring in Western expertise into China and then back out to be deployed in the West so that they can take advantage of the wisdom and experience and the professionalism and so forth. But is there anything else going on there? Only that the FBI in December 2008 called the TTP, the Thousand Talent Plan, part of what they called non-traditional espionage. That's a nice term of art. In other words, I'm not accusing Mr. Meng of anything in particular here. I'm just suggesting that <clears throat> look at his position today. He is chief investment officer of the California Public Employees Retirement System, the largest in the United States, at $370 billion of funds under management. Hmm. That's an interesting coincidence. So I wonder, you know, how many of these firms CalPERS is holding of the illustrations I just gave you off the cuff? 
all of them. All of them. Okay? And this is a sampling. So that's where we are. So again, no accusations being made here. These are just reported facts of the case. You can connect the dots as you deem indicated, just so that we protect the innocent here, uh, namely myself. <laughs> but in any event, uh, please, if you have questions, but I, again, I urge you to, to take this one on board because this is the, this is the Eastern Front. I don't know how to give you a sense of the scale of this. This is bigger than trade, ladies and gentlemen. That's all you see and hear about. This is bigger, right? And who, it, who utterly dominates the economic and financial domain on the planet Earth anyway? I'll tell you who does. We do. Utterly and completely. So what's up with this? This is our sandbox they're playing in. We're not playing in theirs. This is not a right. This is a privilege. And we need to remember that. And we should be screening. Not one Chinese company has ever been list, delisted from the New York uh, from any U.S. exchange for national security or human rights abuses, ever. That's odd. And the list goes on. 